Now that you know the basic mechanism of the Fourier transform, it's time to start learning about some of the important but more subtle features of the Fourier transform. And in this video, I'm going to discuss the frequencies and how to define the frequencies from the Fourier transform, how to convert from indices into units of hertz. And if you're not really sure what I mean by this, then don't worry, that's coming up on the next slide. And that will lead to a discussion, or that will sort of necessitate a discussion, of the frequency boundaries, the lower and upper frequency boundaries of the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform expressed as a loop, or implemented as a loop, in MATLAB code would look something like this. So here we are looping over n frequencies, where n also corresponds to the number of time points. So the number of time points in the signal defines the number of frequencies or the frequency resolution that we can extract from that signal. And then inside this loop, we have two operations. First, we create a complex valued sine wave. So you can see that's e to the i 2 pi f t, where t is this normalized time vector. It goes from zero to one in n steps, where n is the number of time points in the signal. So this is not the same as the time vector that you use to create the signal or that the signal exists in. This is a normalized time vector. It goes from zero to one, or technically one little point below one. And then here we have the frequency of the sine wave, and that's given by the looping index minus one. So notice that this sine wave here, the units are not in hertz. These are not frequencies in hertz. These are frequencies in indices. And this is actually a really important feature of the Fourier transform because you want the Fourier transform to be a general operation that always works. So you don't want to have a different Fourier transform for when you sample your data in milliseconds and a different Fourier transform if you sample your data in days a different Fourier transform if you sample your data in meters, let's say these are space data. So you want the Fourier transform to be generic. You want it to work all the time, regardless of the units of your original signal. And that's why it's important that this time vector be normalized and the frequencies be given in indices and not in some physically meaningful uh, units like Hertz. So anyway, that was the first component of this loop for the Fourier transform. The second part is to compute the Fourier coefficient, which as I've already discussed, is nothing more than a dot product between the uh, complex sine wave and the signal. So you can see here I'm doing element-wise multiplication and then sum, so that is computing the dot product. So once we are finished with this loop, we have all these Fourier coefficients for each frequency but what we want to do for you know, spectral analysis and subsequent time frequency analysis is to interpret these Fourier coefficients in terms of their frequency in hertz, right? That's what we care about. We care about physical units of hertz. So how do we convert from these indices, these looping indices, into units of hertz? Well, this is the formula. We say that the vector of hertz is linearly spaced numbers from zero to the sampling rate divided by two in n divided by two plus one steps. So uh, this sampling rate divided by two is called the Nyquist frequency. I'm gonna write that out in a, in a few slides so you'll see how it, Nyquist is spelled. So zero to Nyquist and the number of steps, the number of frequencies between zero and Nyquist is n divided by two plus one. Again, n is the number of time points in the signal. So you can see that the frequency resolution is determined by the length of the signal. So where do these three parameters come from? Well, I'm gonna spend the rest of the video talking about this parameter and this parameter, and then in a later video, I will discuss more about why we have n over two plus one steps. Okay, so this is the lower bound and the upper bound of the frequencies that we can reconstruct from the Fourier transform. So let's start with thinking about this lower bound. So the question is, what is the lowest frequency that we can think about extracting from a signal? Well, here I have a sine wave with a frequency of two, 
The units don't really matter. You can pretend that this is two hertz. But we can go lower than two, can't we? Of course, we can do one. Can we do lower than one? Yeah, definitely. We can get lower than one. Frequencies, are particularly if they're in some meaningful unit like hertz, these are not limited to integers. We can have a frequency of 0.5, for example, that corresponds to half of a cycle in you know whatever the unit of time is. So how much lower can we go? Well, the answer is we can go all the way to zero. We can have a frequency of zero. And what does that mean to have a frequency of zero? Well, it's literally just a flat line. It's a flat line with a value of one. So all of these points have a value of one. This is often called the DC, where DC stands for direct current. That comes from engineering, thinking about this as DC. So what does it mean in the Fourier transform for a frequency of zero? Let me go back to this uh, code for the Fourier transform. So notice on the first iteration of this loop, fi equals one. So then fi minus one is zero. And then you have basically all of this turns to zero because we're multiplying by zero. So that gives us e to the zero and any number to the power of zero, any number raised to zero is one. So this here, for the first iteration of this loop, this quote-unquote complex sine wave is actually just a vector of all ones. And then what do we do here? We are computing the dot product of the uh, signal and a vector of all ones, which really just means that we're adding up all of the signal values. All the values in the signal get added up together. And then later, we divide by n, we divide by the number of numbers, and then that literally gives us the average value of the signal. So we sum up all the values of the signal, you know, multiplying by one, which means just adding up all the values of the signal, and then divide by the number of elements in the signal that is literally the average. So the zero hertz or DC frequency is literally just the average of all the values in the signal. By the way, I'm gonna talk more in a later video. Uh, I think it's gonna be in two videos from now about why we divide by n, so scaling this by uh, by dividing by n. Okay, but anyway, that is the interpretation of the zero hertz or DC component. I'm also gonna talk more about that in a later video. Okay, so that is the lower bound for frequencies. Now let's talk a little bit about the upper bound. So what is the highest frequency we can measure in a signal? So imagine this is some analog signal out there in the real world, and we want to measure it. We want to discretize and quantify this signal, making sure that we can still recognize that it's an oscillatory rhythmic signal. So it's going up and down. So the question is, what is the theoretical minimum number of points that we need to sample from this signal in order to see that it has this particular frequency? The answer is two samples per cycle. So we need to sample this sine wave at a minimum of two points per cycle in order to see that it's rhythmic, in order to detect its frequency. Now, if you were to sample this signal less than twice per cycle, you would have a situation like this. So here I'm sampling at regular intervals, but it's less than twice per cycle. And now, so this blue curve represents something that's, you know, some, some true signal that's out there in the universe. And the, the cyan dots here, these, these little light blue green dots, this is what we can actually measure with our equipment. So when you look at your measured data, you reconstruct the data, you're gonna draw straight lines between these dots. And the result that you're going to get will look like this. So you can see that this is actually a signal that's fluctuating much more slowly than the true signal was. This is an artifact. This is called aliasing. If you've heard this term before, aliasing, this is what it means. Aliasing is an artifact that's produced when you are sampling higher than the, uh, or sorry, slower than the uh, frequency. Uh, okay, let me try that again. Aliasing is what happens when you sample at less than two times per cycle. That's the better way to explain it. Now, I'd like to also be clear that measuring, so sampling a signal at two times per cycle is kind of a theoretical minimum number of sample points. In practice, you can still actually misrepresent or just entirely miss a sample 
if you're measuring, if you're, if you're quantifying this signal at two times per cycle. For example, here you see an example, we are still measuring this signal, we're still sampling from this analog signal at twice per cycle, but the sample points are not really nicely aligned with the peaks and the troughs. So we're still going to misrepresent this. So in practice, you want to have more than two samples per cycle, but in theory, two samples per cycle is the absolute minimum number of samples that you need to accurately reconstruct a fluctuating signal like this. Okay, so that means our upper bound is two points per cycle, which means one half of the sampling rate. And that is called the Nyquist frequency. One half the sampling rate is called the Nyquist frequency. Now, to be honest, in my opinion, I've always thought this was really unfair. You know, this guy, Nyquist, all he did was divide the sampling rate by two, and he gets this whole thing named after him. But anyway, this is the world we live in, so when you divide the sampling rate by two, that's called the Nyquist frequency. I'm just kidding, by the way. Nyquist actually made some important contributions to uh, sampling theory and discretization and information theory and so on. So in this video, I showed you the formula for converting frequencies from arbitrary indices into units of hertz. That formula is linearly spaced numbers from zero to Nyquist frequency, which is one half the sampling rate. So this is the lower bound, this is the upper bound of the frequencies that we can reconstruct from a sampled signal. And the frequency resolution, or the number of frequencies that you get between zero and Nyquist corresponds to n over two plus one, where n is the number of time points in your signal. Now, I still haven't explained where this quantity comes from. And to understand why n over two plus one is the right answer, you need to learn about the positive and the negative frequencies in the Fourier transform, and that is coming up in the next video.